In this video, our subjects are vital signs, height, and weight. We will discuss getting ready, an introduction to thermometers, how to measure oral temperatures, how to measure rectal temperatures, how to take a radial pulse, how to measure respiration, how to measure blood pressure, how to measure height and weight, and finishing up. Vital signs help us to monitor a patient's or resident's general health and well-being and help us to anticipate potential problems. The word vital means important or essential to survival. The measurement of vital signs such as blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and temperature tells us important information about the health of the people we care for. Nursing assistants are responsible for measuring and recording vital signs in many healthcare settings, so you may be the first member of the healthcare team to recognize a change in a person's vital signs. That change may be the first indication that the person you are caring for is experiencing a significant medical problem. Other people, including nurses and doctors, will rely on the measurements you take. That's why it's important, even vital, that you learn the proper techniques for measuring vital signs as well as height and weight. Preparation, that is getting ready to manage your work in a manner that is safe, Healthful and efficient is key to successful health care. No matter what tasks you'll be performing during your shift, whether those tasks are planned or unanticipated, you will benefit from a routine of careful preparation. Begin each interaction with patients or residents by performing these steps. Wash your hands. Gather all needed supplies. Knock before entering the person's room. Introduce yourself using your name and title and greet the person by name, remembering that a friendly greeting helps establish rapport. Carefully identify the person adhering to your facility's approved method. Explain to the person the procedure you're about to perform and make sure the person understands before you begin. If necessary, show visitors where they can wait outside the room. Provide privacy by closing the door and curtain. As appropriate, drape the person for modesty. And then, throughout the procedure, see to safety using proper body mechanics and following all safety precautions for equipment use and infection control. Body temperature is simply a measurement of how warm a person's body is internally. A higher than normal temperature, that is, a fever, can be a sign of illness or infection. Body temperature is measured using a clinical thermometer of which there are two major types, electronic and glass. Electronic thermometers are battery operated, display the temperature as a numerical readout on a display, and are used for oral, rectal, and axillary or armpit readings. Usually, when the reading is complete, a beep will sound. A tympanic thermometer is a special type of electronic thermometer that is inserted into a person's ear canal to measure the oral temperature. Another special type of electronic thermometer is a temporal artery thermometer, which you sweep across the person's forehead to obtain a body temperature measurement. Although electronic thermometers are preferred in many healthcare settings because of their speed, accuracy, ease of use, and safety, your facility may still use glass thermometers. Glass thermometers contain a liquid such as mercury or another less toxic material that expands when heated. Heat causes the liquid inside the thermometer to move up the tube. The level of the liquid is compared to the scale markings on the outside of the tube to measure the temperature. Glass thermometers display either a Fahrenheit scale, extending from 94 degrees to 108 degrees in increments of two-tenths of a degree, or a Celsius scale, displaying 34 degrees to 43 degrees in increments of one-tenth of a degree. Before using a glass thermometer, you must shake it as demonstrated here.
so that the liquid falls to below 94 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 degrees Celsius. Read the glass thermometer by holding it between your thumb and index finger and raising it to eye level. The liquid inside will look like a very thin line, but as you slowly rotate the thermometer, the line will appear thicker. When it does, take the reading at the end of the line farthest away from the bulb. Glass thermometers are used primarily for obtaining oral and rectal temperature readings, which we demonstrate later in the video, and axillary or armpit measurements. To take an axillary measurement, first shake down the thermometer. If necessary, remove the person's arm from its sleeve. Carefully position the bulb end of the thermometer in the center of the armpit or axilla. When using a glass thermometer to take an axillary reading, be sure to leave it in place for 10 minutes. It is important to note that normal body temperature varies slightly from person to person and typically may be anywhere from one half degree Fahrenheit to one degree Fahrenheit higher or lower than the range generally considered normal for the population at large. However, if you discover an elevation in temperature in a patient or resident that exceeds this variation, report your findings to the nurse immediately. Note that the method used to measure the temperature affects the accuracy of the measurement. Therefore, when you record the temperature, you should note which method was used in accordance with your facility's policy. To measure oral temperature with an electronic thermometer, you'll need a unit with an oral probe plus a probe sheath or cover. Note that the oral probe has a blue tip that distinguishes it from the rectal probe which has a red tip. If the person is on oxygen, the temperature should be taken via another method such as tympanic or axillary. This is because oxygen is cool and tends to falsely lower a person's oral temperature reading. First, ask the patient or resident if within the past 15 minutes she has had anything to eat or drink. If so, wait another 15 to 30 minutes before proceeding, or follow your facility's policy. No. Okay, good. Next, cover the probe with the probe sheath. Then, turn the thermometer on and wait for the ready signal. Ask the person to open her mouth. Open your mouth. Slowly and carefully, insert the probe so that the tip rests under the person's tongue and to one side. Ask the person to gently close her mouth around the probe while being careful not to bite down. Ask the person to breathe through the nose. You may need to hold the probe in place. A few seconds later, the instrument will signal completion. Ask the person to open her mouth again. Remove the probe and read the temperature on the display screen. Okay, good. Everything looks good. Dispose of the probe sheath in an appropriate waste container. Then, place the instrument in its charger, if necessary. The technique used when taking an oral temperature with a glass thermometer is very similar to that used when using an electronic thermometer. However, when using a glass thermometer to take an oral temperature, be sure to leave it in place for three to five minutes. Record the person's name, the time, the temperature, and the method used in the person's medical record or, if the record is not kept at bedside, on a notepad, transferring the information to the person's record at the earliest opportunity. Remember, if the reading is either above or below the person's normal temperature range, it should be reported to the nurse immediately. In many instances, the rectal method of measuring temperature may be preferred, such as when the person has had oral surgery, is too young to hold an oral thermometer properly underneath the tongue, when the person is unconscious, or when other measuring techniques are unavailable. Do not take a rectal temperature if the person has hemorrhoids, rectal bleeding, or a disease involving the rectum, has diarrhea, has had rectal surgery, or has certain heart conditions. To measure a rectal temperature with an electronic thermometer, be sure to gather gloves, paper towels, tissues, a probe sheath or cover, a thermometer with a rectal probe, and lubricant jelly. 
Position the bed at a working height appropriate for good body mechanics. Then make sure the wheels are locked for safety. If the side rails are in use, lower only the side rail on the working side of the bed. Then lower the head of the bed so that the bed is as flat as the patient or resident can tolerate. Okay, I'm going to have you lie on your side. Roll this way. Ask the person to lie on his side facing away from you in the Sims position as demonstrated. This makes insertion of the probe easier and more comfortable for the person. Fan fold the top linens to just below the person's hips. Put on your gloves. Open the lubricant and apply a small amount to a paper towel. Adjust the person's bedclothes to expose the buttocks. Cover the probe with the sheath. Lubricate the probe. Okay. Use one hand to raise the person's upper buttock to expose the anus. Now, use the other hand to gently and carefully insert the probe, one inch or less for adults, a half inch or less for children. Never force the probe into the rectum. If you encounter difficulty inserting the probe, stop and call the nurse. Hold the probe in place until the device signals completion. Then remove the probe and read the temperature. Next, set down the probe momentarily while you wipe the lubricant from the person's anal area. Then adjust the bedclothes to cover the person's buttocks and help the person back into a comfortable position. Next, remove the probe sheath and dispose of it in an approved waste container. Replace the probe. Turn the instrument off if necessary. Place the instrument in its charger. Remove your gloves and wash your hands. Note the person's name and temperature, the time and the method on your notepad. Then complete your finishing up steps as described in the final section of this video. Remember to tell the nurse immediately about any abnormal readings. The second vital sign we will look at is pulse rate. The pulse is a throbbing sensation just underneath the skin which can be felt by placing your fingers gently over an artery that runs close to the surface of the skin. Here, for example, at the carotid artery in the neck or here at the radial artery in the wrist. The pulse rate tells us how fast or slow the heart is beating. As with temperature, there is an accepted normal range of pulse rates. With adults, the normal range is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. As you measure a person's pulse, you will also observe the rhythm of the pulse and its amplitude or quality. The rhythm of a pulse is the pattern of pulses and the pauses between them. Normally, the rhythm is constant, smooth, and regular. If the rhythm is irregular, it could be a sign that the heart is unable to provide a steady supply of blood to the body. The amplitude or quality of a pulse is a measure of its force, that is, how strong it is. If the pulse is weak and difficult to feel, it could be a sign that the heart is unable to get enough blood circulating throughout the body. To measure a person's radial pulse, the only supply you'll need is a watch with a second hand. How are you? First, have the person rest his arm comfortably. Is that comfortable? Yes. Okay. Using two or three fingers, locate the radial pulse. It will be toward the thumb side of the wrist. Note both the strength of the pulse and how regular it is. To measure the pulse rate, look at your watch and wait for the second hand to reach the 12 or the 6. When it does, begin counting the pulse. If the pulse is regular, count the number of pulses in 30 seconds and multiply that by 2 to get the pulse rate per minute. If the pulse is irregular, count pulses for 60 seconds. 
Remember to record the person's name, the time, and the pulse rate rhythm and amplitude. If you find that the person has an abnormal pulse rate, rhythm, or amplitude, report your observations to the nurse immediately. Respiration is the process of breathing. Usually, you will measure the person's respirations immediately after you measure the pulse. One respiration equals one inhalation plus one exhalation. When you measure the respiratory rate, you are counting the number of respirations per minute. Under normal conditions, a healthy resting adult will breathe about 16 to 20 times a minute. Report any respiratory rate greater than 20 breaths per minute or less than 12 breaths per minute to the nurse immediately. In addition to measuring the respiratory rate, you will observe the respiratory rhythm, which is the regularity with which the respirations occur, and the respiratory depth or quality of each respiration. To measure a person's respirations, you will need your watch with a second hand, just as you did when measuring the pulse. To perform the procedure, wait until the second hand on your watch gets to 12 or 6, then look at the person's chest and count each rise and fall as one respiration. If the respiratory rhythm is regular, count the respirations that occur in 30 seconds and multiply that number by 2 to get the respiratory rate per minute. If the rhythm is irregular, count for a full minute but do not multiply by 2. Be sure to record the person's name, the time, and the respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality. If you find that the person has an abnormal respiratory rate, rhythm or quality, report your observations to the nurse immediately. Blood pressure measurements can be used to help assess a person's health and risk for disease. Too little pressure means the body isn't getting enough oxygen and nutrients. Too much pressure means the heart is working too hard. Blood pressure is the force that the blood exerts against the arterial walls. Blood pressure is measured as two separate numbers. As systolic pressure, which is the pressure when the heart muscle contracts or squeezes, sending a wave of blood into the arteries. And as diastolic pressure, the pressure when the heart muscle relaxes. Accepted normal ranges for the systolic pressure are between 100 and 140 millimeters of mercury and for the diastolic pressure between 60 and 90 millimeters of mercury. To take a person's blood pressure, first gather some alcohol wipes, a stethoscope, and a sphygmomanometer. Start the procedure by helping the person into a sitting or lying position. Position the arm so the forearm is level with the heart and the palm is facing up. Then help the person roll up her sleeve to expose the upper arm. Do not take a blood pressure measurement over clothing. Use alcohol wipes to clean the stethoscope's earpieces, diaphragm, and bell. Squeeze the air out of the cuff and then turn the valve on the bulb clockwise to close it. Now locate the brachial artery in the antecubital space by placing your fingers at the inner aspect of the elbow. Locate the arrow mark on the cuff and place it over the brachial artery. Wrap the cuff around the upper arm so the bottom of the cuff is at least an inch above the elbow. Make sure it's even and snug. Place the stethoscope earpieces in your ears. With one hand, hold the bulb. With the other, feel for the person's radial pulse. Inflate the cuff until you're unable to feel the radial pulse. Then inflate the cuff 30 millimeters of mercury more. Put the stethoscope's diaphragm over the brachial artery. Turn the valve on the bulb slightly counterclockwise to let the air slowly escape. 
As the pressure in the cuff falls, as indicated by either the needle on the aneroid dial or by the column of mercury, blood will suddenly begin to flow through the brachial artery and you will start hearing the pulse. This is called a Karotkov sound and the sound may change as you listen. Watch the manometer and note the reading when you hear the first Karotkov sound. It will sound like this. This is the systolic reading. Keep watching the manometer as the cuff deflates. Note the reading when you hear the last Karatkov sound. It will sound like this. This is the diastolic reading. To complete the procedure, deflate the cuff and take it off the person's arm. The blood pressure is recorded as a fraction with the higher systolic pressure recorded first and then the diastolic pressure, as in this example where the measurement would be expressed as 150 over 80. Report any abnormal readings to the nurse immediately. Return the sphygma manometer to its case or holder. And finally, clean the stethoscope with alcohol wipes. Remember to record the person's name, the time, and the blood pressure reading. Although height and weight are not technically vital signs, these measurements are important too. Height is usually measured only on admission, but weight might be rechecked monthly or it may need to be checked on a weekly basis. A person's weight is used to help determine drug dosages and changes in weight may indicate changes in a person's nutritional health. Obtaining a consistently accurate measurement is important. So prior to weighing a patient or resident, offer the person an opportunity to urinate. Also, each time a weight measurement is taken, make sure the person is wearing approximately the same amount of clothing and always take the measurement at approximately the same time of day. To obtain an accurate measurement of weight using an upright scale, begin by moving the weights all the way to the left of the balance bar. Help the person onto the platform of the scale facing the balance bar. Do not let the person hold on to you or the scale. This can affect the accuracy of the measurement. Move the larger weight toward the right to the weight that is closest to but less than the person's estimated weight. Then move the lighter weight on the top scale bar toward the right until the balance pointer is centered. Read the numbers where the two weights end up and add the numbers together. This is a person's weight, here measured in pounds. To measure a person's height, help the person face the opposite direction, away from the scale bar. Slide the height scale up so that you can pull out the height rod without striking the person. Slide the height rod down until it lightly touches the top of the person's head. Read the number at the point where the height rod meets the height scale. This is the height, here measured in inches. Help the person down from the scale. Be sure to record the person's name, the time, and the weight and height. Then help the person back to her room. There may be times when your resident or patient is not able to stand long enough to obtain a standing weight. In such cases, a chair scale should be used to measure weight. There are two types of chair scales. One type is simply a chair-like device that allows the person to sit while having his weight measured. To use this type of chair scale, assist the person into the scale's seat using a transfer belt, a wheelchair, or both. The second type of chair scale is designed to accommodate the person's own wheelchair. If you are using this type of chair scale, roll the wheelchair onto the platform and lock the wheels. 
Either type of scale may require you to manually slide weight bars or will be electronic. Read the weight on the display. For the wheelchair scale, you'll need to subtract the weight of the empty chair. Then, finish the procedure by helping the person off the scale. If you use the wheelchair scale, unlock the chair's wheels and roll it off the platform. Help the person back to his room. If you used a regular chair scale, help the person out of the chair and back into a wheelchair if you used one for the transfer. Record the time, the person's name, and the weight. When you have finished with a procedure, always follow a routine of finishing up to ensure your patients or residents safety and comfort. First, confirm comfort and good body alignment, whether the person is seated or in a bed. Leave the person's call light control within easy reach and do the same for any other items the person may want, such as remote control devices, the telephone, or fresh water. Next, see to safety. If appropriate, return the bed to its lowest position. Then, make sure the wheels are locked for safety and place the side rails in ordered or requested positions. If desired, open the curtain or door and ask whether the person would like for visitors to return. If you use gloves, first discard them according to your facility's policy. Then, wash your hands. Finally, report and record all pertinent information about the procedure, including the date and time of the procedure and your full name and title.